This lecture is about the excavation methodology for archaeological sites in Japan, its background, and the general procedures. The lecture is divided into three parts. In part one, I'm going to explain the types of excavation in Japan, their background, and the preparation and planning for excavations. Handbooks for archaeological excavations are published by the Agency for Cultural Affairs to enhance the knowledge and skills of investigators and to ensure a certain level of excavation skill in Japan. There are three handbooks available. One on the methodology for excavating settlement sites, which are the most common type of investigation. One on the task of processing the finds from excavations and the contents of site reports, and finally, one on methods of excavation for sites other than settlements. This lecture is mostly based on these handbooks. Excavations in Japan can generally be classed into four stages. All of these stages are carried out in accordance with the law for the protection of cultural properties. The first stage involves the identification of a site and making its existence known. At this stage, distribution surveys and test excavations are conducted. Next, it is the stage of coordination regarding how to treat archaeological sites that have been discovered. At this stage, further test excavations are conducted to clarify the contents of sites. Based on the results, the local government will consult with the various companies and organisations involved with the site regarding its preservation. Based on the contents of these consultations, the next stage is excavation aimed at preservation. However, there are two types of preservation. Preservation in situ, to avoid damage or loss of a site, and preservation by record when an excavation is conducted and detailed records are kept in cases where conserving the current form of a site is impossible. When in situ preservation is intended, an excavation for the purpose of preservation is carried out on the condition of taking great care to avoid damage to the site in order to assess the site's characteristics and extent. By contrast, in the case of preservation by record, an excavation must be conducted thoroughly over the entire area of the site because it will be destroyed following the investigation. Further investigation may be conducted to obtain data necessary for such utilisation with the purpose of preserving the site as well. I will now draw on some actual examples to introduce each of these stages. Let me start with a distribution survey conducted during the stage of site identification. The purpose of the survey is to assess, in broad terms, the extent of a site. It involves a field investigation to determine traces of the site that can be observed on the surface and confirms the presence or absence of surface artefacts. Figure 1. Then, the extent of the site determined by the survey is plotted on paper to produce a site map, figure 2. In Japan, each local government makes such maps and uses them as data for discussions about areas of development projects and ways of dealing with the preservation of sites. Next, we look at test excavations carried out in the identification and coordination stages. The aim is to broadly understand the extent and contents of a site in a similar manner to the distribution survey, but the main difference being that we actually excavate part of the site to determine whether buried archaeological features are present. If significant features are confirmed, this leads to a full-scale excavation. In the case of a development project, however, depending on the scale and nature of the development, some adjustment may be made so that that development can proceed without affecting the site, thereby avoiding a full-fledged excavation, or limiting its extent 
while making effective use of the trial excavation data. However, it must be said that in reality, it is difficult to preserve all archaeological sites. Therefore, rather than totally losing those sites to development, we conduct complete and thorough excavations to record such sites through reports and so forth. This is called preservation by record. Among excavations conducted in Japan, this type is most common, numbering close to 8,000 annually. Figure 1 is an example of an excavation for the construction of a condominium. In such cases, the entire area that will be destroyed by the construction is excavated. Figure 2 is an excavation accompanying construction for the rebuilding of a road. In cases where construction for a new road extends over many kilometres, the excavation may take several years. On the other hand, if it has been decided to preserve an archaeological site, then excavation for the purpose of preservation is carried out. As excavation necessarily involves digging, which in itself is destructive, this type of excavation tries to limit digging to the minimum necessary. For example, if building remains such as post holes are discovered during an excavation for preservation by record, as in the cases just discussed, then all of the post holes would be completely excavated and fully recorded. But in an excavation for preservation, the digging would be stopped at a level where the outlines of the post holes could be confirmed, and only an essential number of post holes would be selected for complete excavation, as shown in the photo. In Japan, most excavations conducted for academic purposes are conducted in the same manner as those for preservation in situ. Last, we will look at excavations for the purpose of utilization. This is a continuation of the process in which excavation is conducted for preservation and is carried out to acquire data necessary for the management and utilization of a site, also while keeping the digging to a minimum. Unlike other types of excavation, plans for the final utilization and presentation of the site are already formulated before excavation. So, the work is conducted as a part of those plans. Figure 1 shows an excavation as part of the preparations of the Nara Palace Site Historical Park, and Figure 2 shows the current condition after completion of the site for public presentation. So far, I have introduced various types of excavation, but before any excavation begins, an overall plan for the investigation must be made, and careful preparations carried out based on that plan. This chart shows the procedure for conducting an excavation. The investigation plan must be drawn up, keeping all of this in mind. We begin with preparations for keeping a record during the excavation. Specifically, this includes setting up a datum point as the reference for measurements making a topographical survey from that datum, and laying out a grid for the excavation. Prior to these steps, conducting geophysical exploration prospection, can also provide valuable data to use for reference, as shown in the left portion of the diagram. After these preparations, the excavation will be carried out, and I will explain the procedure in the next part of this lecture. Among preparations for excavation, it is essential to carry out the survey work beforehand for sites that are flat and spacious. At the Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Properties, surveying is conducted using GPS in accordance with the World Geodetic System, Figure 1. Based on the survey, a 3 metre square grid is laid out and measurements of artefacts and features are carried out based on these grid units. 
In figure 2, the red rectangle is the area of the excavation, and the grid must be set up to cover the entire area. Grid designations are made with two letters of the alphabet, plus two digit numbers, used for assessing artifacts and features within each unit. The reason for using 3 meter square grid units is that our institute mainly excavates buildings of the 7th and 8th centuries, for which post holes placed every 3 meters are common. It is important to set the grid units to match conditions at sites in each region. Prior to setting up an excavation precinct, conducting a geophysical survey prospection beforehand can provide useful results to make the task easier. Figure 1 shows a ground penetrating radar survey being conducted to assess underground conditions before excavating. Figure 2 shows the results. The red areas indicate a high possibility that features are present. So, the excavation area should be set to include these locations. This enables the investigators to conduct the excavation more efficiently. This is the end of part 1. I will explain the actual procedure for excavation in the next part. Excavation Methods for Archaeological Sites, Part 2 The lecture is divided into three parts. In Part 2, I am going to explain the actual procedure of excavation and its basic ideas. After completing the preparations for excavation and the formulation of an overall plan, which I covered in Part 1, we can begin the actual excavation. As for the excavation procedure, 1. Start with removing the topsoil by heavy machinery. 2. Remove cultural material bearing layers to the level where features are exposed. 3. Detect the features and excavate them. 4. Map each feature and take photographs. 5. Conduct supplementary excavation of areas that have been inadequately investigated. And 6. Backfill the entire survey area. When a site has features from multiple periods, however, we repeat the process from steps 2, removing the cultural bearing layers, to step 5, supplementary excavation for each period. In addition, we carry out mapping, photography, and scientific analyses at any time as necessary. I will now explain the above using images of actual conditions on site. First of all, digging is done with heavy machinery to the depth of features of the target period. Of course, if the depth is found to be too shallow, we dig further by hand. It is very important when digging with heavy machinery to stop at a level slightly higher than the target depth, because of the possibility of damaging the layer with features if we dig to the target depth all at once. If you do not know the depth, it is a good idea to dig down carefully while examining the traces of artifacts and features, and studying changes in the soil layers. After the digging with heavy machinery is completed, we switch to human power and dig carefully by hand to locate the level of features. It is important to understand the basic stratigraphy of the excavation area. This slide shows two kinds of basic stratigraphy. Can you recognize the difference? If you look at the two diagrams from the bottom, there is layer X as the base layer, layer K which cuts into it, and layer Y, which is fill above these two layers. What I want you to pay attention to is the presence of the hole, marked C, that cuts into layer X. In the upper diagram, the same soil of layer Y is deposited in the hole, but in the lower image, the soil in the hole is different, marked Z. 
In the upper case, the hole was filled during the stage when layer Y was deposited, but in the lower case, layer Y was deposited after the hole had already been filled. In other words, you can see that the time when the hole was filled with soil is different for the two diagrams. In this way, the basic stratigraphy allows us to gain further understandings of the site. Let's look at more specific examples. This is a cross-sectional view of the Tagajo castle remains in Miyagi Prefecture. Let's look at this stratigraphy, starting from the bottom layer. 1. Directly over the natural ground are the 8th and 7th layers. A building from a later period, SB187A, cuts vertically through both the 7th and 8th layers. 2. The building was buried by the 6th layer, and subsequently, the 5th layer was put down when the Suji wall, SF108B, and its rainfall ditch, SD081, were built. 3. After the wall collapsed due to fire, the 4th layer was created around it, and the new wall, SF108C, was established. It can be seen that construction is divided into three periods. This is the basic stratigraphy of the Da Zaifu government office in Fukuoka Prefecture. Look at this from the bottom layer. 1. The site was formed by the first leveled ground layer, and post holes and ditches were built through this layer. 2. The second level ground layer was laid on the first layer, and a hole for setting a pillar base stone was dug into this layer. 3. The third leveled ground layer was laid down, and a new pillar base stone was installed in almost the same position as the earlier one. Three periods are thus recognized in the Da Zaifu government office. In this way, reading the basic stratigraphy is indispensable to understanding the site. Let's now assume that we have actually located the level where features are exposed and proceed with the work. We try to detect the features at the surface in horizontal outline based on differences in color and quality of the soil. At this time, it is important to actually draw lines on the ground surface outlining the features and examine the relationships of overlap between features to confirm which features, newer, cut through others, older. Drawing a simplified diagram at this point can help in understanding interrelations among the features. Next, we start digging from the newest features as judged by the relations of overlap. Instead of digging any feature to its bottom all at once, we carefully dig downwards while leaving unexcavated belts in which we can observe the soil layers. This is not only an exercise in caution, but it is also to illustrate visually the relations of overlap among features. Then, the portions of the newer features that do not overlap with older ones are excavated completely. Unexcavated belts are removed after records are made of the soil strata. We have to dig with great care, because sometimes more features may be detected as we dig. Subsequently, excavate the older features bit by bit. But it is important to dig so that the relations of overlap among features can be clearly understood. We excavate the older features in the same manner. Here as well, unexcavated belts are left where features overlap in order to observe the soil strata, and records can be carefully made. When excavating the older features further, 
we make sure to leave belts showing the outlines where they had been cut by newer features, to make the relationship of overlap easier to understand in the photos. Finally, all of the belts left for observing the soil strata are removed after recording, and the features completely exposed. If there are still unexcavated overlapping features, repeat the above processes. Next, I'm going to explain how to take up artifacts. This photograph is a case where a building was discovered buried in a collapsed condition. In such cases, it is possible to restore the building based on the excavated artifacts. Therefore, it is necessary to take up the artifacts carefully while noting accurately the details of their condition of discovery. It is important to note the precise location of where an artifact was found for any artifact that is collected and taken up. Figure 1 shows how artifacts are mapped, indicating the type of item in a horizontal plan in the excavation area. Also, for artifacts found within the same feature, we have to clearly note which soil layers they come from. Figure 2 is a cross-sectional view of a well. By identifying whether an artifact was buried inside or outside a well, or which soil layer it came from, we can understand when the well was made and the process of it being buried. Figure 3 is a record label that is used when collecting artifacts. The record label enables us to record data on artifacts conveniently. The record label lists the site name, grid number and feature name, stratigraphic horizon name or layer, the finds number noted in a plan, and the date taken up. Organising the artifacts with this label can help to interpret the entire site. This is the end of part two. I will explain how to make records during excavation in part three. Excavation methods for archaeological sites, part three. This lecture is divided into three parts. In part three, I'm going to explain the methods of recording and how scientific analysis can be used to deepen our understanding of archaeological sites. Whenever artifacts or features are discovered, they must be recorded on a two-dimensional plan. In recent years, there are many methods that have developed, such as digital surveying, but here I will only show you the lowest cost method. Figure 1 shows the use of three meter lengths of measuring tape, laid out to create one of the three meter grids, used as a reference for mapping horizontal locations within the site. In cases where there are concentrations of artifacts, or when making fine measurements of features, such as stone structures, a 1 meter by 1 meter square divided into a 10 centimeter mesh is used, as shown in figure 2. When excavating a large site, it may be difficult to understand the entire picture. Therefore, schematic views are created. This is a document called a Features Card, used by our institute. This covers nine units of the 3 meter grid, showing the location of the features sketched in, as well as the dates these features were excavated and which features yielded artifacts. We put together these sheets to create a schematic view of the entire site. This allows us to grasp an overall picture of the site as the work progresses and when processing the finds after the excavation, helps to identify accurately which artifacts were recovered at what time from which features. This is not a schematic view, but an example of a measured drawing of all of the features found in an excavation. 
It is important to clearly show the outlines of the features and the elevation at each point of them. We will cover cross-sectional drawings later, but in cases where drawing a cross-section was overlooked during the excavation, when necessary, we can use the elevations recorded on a horizontal plan to make a cross-sectional view. There are also lines drawn in red and in blue in the figure, as colours are used to show the distribution of features from different time periods. In this figure, features drawn in black are from the most recent period, with those in red being older, and those in blue from the oldest period. In this way, a single drawing may illustrate the relative ages of features, but in cases that are very complicated, it is a good idea to divide the features among several different drawings. The first image of this slide shows the making of a drawing of soil layers in cross-sectional view. When making a cross-sectional drawing, you need to set up one, a vertical line, to use as the base for measuring horizontal distances, and two, a horizontal line, to serve as the baseline for drawing the elevation onto the actual soil using a tape measure or piece of mason's line or surveying string. After that, key points such as the borders where soil strata change or large stones and artifacts within soil layers are all measured in terms of their vertical and horizontal distances from the two baselines and plotted on the drawing accordingly. The next image shows an example. A cross-sectional view, seen at the bottom, must relate to the actual features, seen at top, in plan view. Detailed characteristics of each soil layer must be recorded, including the colour, nature of the soil, density and size of small stones, presence of artefacts, and so forth. In addition, in the case of sites that are used over multiple periods, it is advisable to record while on site which layer belongs to which period. In Japan, a standard soil colour chart is used to indicate soil colour tone. This is published by the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries and was originally produced for soil science, not archaeology but it is widely used at excavation sites all over Japan since it is very useful. This chart allows us to identify the different soil colours in each soil horizon and describe the soil colours in standard notation. Along with drawings, photography is an important method for recording. In Japan, when excavation has progressed to some extent, it is common practice to clean the entire survey area and take photographs before drawing horizontal plans. This is because it is desirable to take photographs when the site is at its cleanest stage, as the investigated area usually gets dirty during drawing. When taking photos, we photograph from as high a position as possible in order to get all of the excavation area in one photo. Specifically, we take photos from a scaffold or use a digital camera with a remote control on a high pole. It is necessary to consider the shooting position and time to avoid the photographer's shadow from showing in the photograph. In the case of a very large archaeological site, a radio controlled helicopter, balloon or a bucket crane vehicle is used to capture a broader view of the site. The use of drones for photography is recently becoming very popular. Another important part of recording is a work log for noting the daily progress and views about the excavation. The log should record the weather, work tasks, opinions at the time about the site and features, the names of the recorders, and the file numbers and thumbnails of any photos that are taken. Since written descriptions in many cases cannot express everything, attaching sketches, as already noted, 
inscribed with comments is a good idea. Finally, let me briefly introduce methods of analysis in the natural sciences that provide important clues to deepen our understanding of archaeological sites. 1. Pollen analysis. By extracting and analysing pollen contained in buried soil, it is possible to learn about the environment in the environs of a site. For example, if large amounts of rice or wheat pollen are detected at a site, it suggests that such grains were grown in the surrounding area. 2. Radiocarbon dating and dendrochronology. This can help identify the approximate ages that sites were formed. In Japan, wood and carbonized material are often analyzed, so these materials are given priority when taken up in excavation. 3. Analysis of faunal remains and human bones. This can provide clues to learn about the way of life of the period. Faunal remains tell us about dietary habits and the utilization of domesticated animals. Human bones provide information about people's daily life and may provide evidence of illness and injuries from warfare. 4. Finally, there is soil analysis. This is very important for knowing about the formation and burial processes of sites. In recent years, it has been shown possible in Japan to observe traces of earthquakes and tsunamis while conducting soil analysis. There are many other types of natural scientific investigations, and it is important to choose the appropriate methods after considering the conditions of sites and artifacts. This concludes my lecture. I hope you will make efforts to utilize what you have learned from this lecture in conducting efficient and effective excavations.